um, with the help of John Gardner, um, a guy from the Groth community who taught me a bit about it. And some things I did was making sure there are as little as possible style attributes in the HTML code. Style attributes in the HTML code are a layering violation, kind of, because the HTML has to present the content and its logical function, whereas the, the styling has to be done in CSS. And in particular, I got rid of all style attributes that specify fixed widths. Fixed widths are very bad for small screen because an indentation that looks good on the big screen will move the text all to the right on your phone and then you have a small column that nobody can read in the extremity. I introduced a media directive to query the size of the screen and adapt the indentations to that. And a, a terrible thing is that Almost all mobile browsers assume that all web pages are 1,000 pixels wide, even those that would readily adapt to anything. So before I did this workaround with meta name viewport at the beginning of the HTML, the land of output would also always be in the top left corner, very small, and you couldn't read anything. That's really a design problem in HTML and CSS that you have to do something in HTML to work around problems in CSS and problems in browsers. But right now, manual pages from Mandog start looking reasonable on phones. Um, other CSS improvements include that the class attributes Remember, you can't style according to the, um, to the elements because most of them are code anyway. The class attributes are now the real mdoc macros. So if you read the source code, you see the real mdoc macros where the stuff came from. And that's good because it makes the code easier to understand, saving the reader from having to learn yet another syntax. You have to learn mdoc macros and there aren't that many of them, so you're so that are relevant anyway, when you want to, to write or edit manual pages. Um, the CSS now uses child selectors where appropriate, rather than assigning yet another separate class to the child, which makes the code much nicer for people who know CSS. It avoids overqualified CSS selectors, so it specifies only in the CSS, only the, uh, what is necessary to select the right rule and not both the class and the element when one of them is redundant. It consistently uses EM units throughout, which makes the, the sizes more predictable. And one thing that I'm still looking for help, you know, in the OpenBSD community, we have a terrible lack of front-end developers. There's really nobody who knows how to do web front-end development. At least I don't know anybody. I don't know how that is in 3DSD. As you can see on our website. Well, that is, that is KISS. Keep it stupid simple. That's good. But yeah, when you want to do responsive uh, design, you need to know some things. It's not just KISS. Anyway, um, it is in, in HTML and CSS, it's very tricky to have a tag list where you want the text body on the same line when the tag is short and on the following line when the tag gets large. I have something that kind of works, but it's still somewhat fragile, so if somebody knows a better solution for that, please contact me. Okay. Now, so far the things were rather technical, now let's get to things that are really useful for users. When you use the search form on man.openbsd.org or manpages.dvn.org or such a page, then of course in the browser bar afterwards you will get a URI pointing to the resource that was found. And I wrote Mandoc in a way that that actually shows 
a human reader to the task, one thing. And the second thing is that you know this thing of less of uh, C tags in the manual pages where you can search with less, less colon T. I talked about that at multiple uh, conferences. Um, which basically lets you find not just a word in the manual page, but the place where the word is defined, just like you find the definition of a function in a C file. And you can now also use that in, on the web, because at the same places I insert ID attributes into the HTML code, and then you can deep link to them. That's extremely useful when you are answering questions in, uh, on mailing lists, when people ask, how do I do this thing? Then you say, okay, you go to the manual page, you look for this or that option, and then I just quote a URI like this, man of the BSD org, the name, the section, a hash mark, and the thing I'm looking for, and it will put the detail right into the right place. This syntax causes me to hardly use the, the web search interface anymore except for complicated apropos searches because I just type in these URIs. It's, it's clear what they will be. Right? Okay. Love this feature. This is really, yeah, very useful. Yeah. So, Useful. then you have these, these anchors and of course, if you, lose, you look at the manual page, or at any web page in general, you don't see the anchors because they are only in the source code. So what I'm doing in the manual output is if there is an anchor that you could deep link to, I put a dot, dotted underline below it, and if you hover the mouse about that thing, you, with a right click, you can copy the URI and then post it somewhere else, for example, in the email you are writing to help a user find the definition of the feature in the documentation. And then, um, of course, all this only works for MDoc manual pages. For the old style man language, it doesn't work because basically it doesn't have any semantical markup, it just has the, there it only works for the, for the big headers. Um, there are some other small things, but I think all these small things really sum up to, to make the, the big picture more usable in the end. For example, you now have the, the name of the manual page in the title attribute, and since many search engines use the title attribute, you will, in the search engines, you will see right away what the page that is linked to actually is, and um, most manual pages have leading comments showing also in copyright and I also now preserve these as HTML comments in the rendered manual page such that the credits don't get lost. Okay. This, all of what I've shown until here does not really exploit the full power of the end of language. It still only has shown um, bold and italic and some links, but now with the man of output you can even see what the marked up things on the screen are when you hover your mouse about them. It will display as a tooltip this is a function name, or this is a command line argument, or this is a function argument, or whatever by showing the mdoc macro. <coughs> this is, right now, this is implemented as a title attribute. That needs to be improved because that confuses screen readers, but the basic feature is already there. Okay, I think this is the final part about manual pages on the web. And this is uh, one thing that is really about performance. Yes? Do you, do you handle um, mass modified by HTTP stuff yet? No. Sorry. No. Uh, 
That would also be related to optimization and probably be used. Yeah, it would not be useful here. I'll come back to it at the end of this slide. Um, a man open BSD arc, we have no problem whatsoever because traffic is so moderate that the machine is mostly sitting idle and can easily add, render each request page on demand. By contrast, then pages Debian org had traffic that was so massive that one or two years ago, the whole service went down due to overload because it was trying to render in real time with Groth. So they decided, okay, let's use Mandoc rather than Graph with typical Linux manual pages that gives a speed up of a factor of two or three. With BSD manual pages, it would give a speed up of about a factor of five. And then let's pre render the pages and serve static pages instead of rendering on demand. And that's the answer to your question on openbsd.org. It's really not relevant. And on manpages org, it's not relevant either because they pre-render anyway. You can change that. Just put a bit of a load on the box. Yeah, we, we welcome everybody to use OpenBSD, but we don't do marketing. So it's not so easy to, to put a lot there. We, we really focus on making a good thing and not on selling it. Yeah. Did you, did you get my pass from the Facebook like button? <laughs> <laughs> I can look it up. It was two years ago. What do you mean? I threatened to 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 take out the the Facebook integration from your subsurface part, but when you objected, I left it in. So perhaps that's an answer. <laughs> Okay, for for Indian, even the pre-rendering needs to be fast because they want to repeat the rendering as often as possible to always have their manual pages up to date, at least daily. So what they are doing is they do not fork mandoc for each and every manual page, but run a small mandoc daemon that takes two file descriptors, an input and output file descriptor of a repack, renders the thing, and then gets the next one which gave them a speed up of a factor of three or so, just getting rid of the forking. That's the man of D and Catman, which Michael Sta uh, Michael Stapelberg wrote, and I helped him a bit with it. It's now working great. Also, uh, Arch Linux is now also formatting their manual pages on their official wiki with, uh, with Mando. And the latest thing that I heard is that GitHub staff is right now considering support for manual pages using Mandoc. They have an open pull request, it's already implemented, they just need to, to actually do it. Now, um, I, this is not that I'm recommending GitHub, I don't think it is part of the free software world anymore after the acquisition by Microsoft, but it's used by so many people that it's kind of uh, relevant if they are doing it, it would somehow provoke promote manual pages. Okay, talking about GitHub, there is this disease called Markdown. <laughs> uh, some years ago, one previous the developer approached me and said, couldn't you have a Markdown output mode for MDoc? I like writing my manual pages in MDoc, but there are some policies that require me to provide Markdown uh, documentation in this and that project. And then the same thing happened to me with a, with a, a Node BSD rep, a developer, right filter, who also wanted that. And so I sat down and said, okay, let's do it. And it turned out to be quite simple. I finished it in just about two weeks working on it part time. Um, you basically have to write a macro dispatch table for, where for each macro, you say this macro will be translated to this um, output, in this case in Markdown format or whatever language you are converting to, and that's the same for each language. Writing that is, has become quite easy in, in Mandoc. The problems that do occur are mostly related to quirks 
in the math uh, in the markdown language. For example, um, in the markdown language, you have a lot of very common characters like asterisks and underscores that have special meanings in some contexts, but not in others. So the markdown language is terribly context sensitive. So more than 10% of the code I had to write is just to handle um, this context sensitivity of the markdown language and making sure that I'm not accidentally doing markdown escaping in, in some context where I'm just trying to print a normal character. And block nesting in markdown is also completely horrific and um, context sensitive. You can embed HTML in Markdown and then Markdown having uh, have again Markdown inside the HTML. So that required another hundred lines of code. And uh, what is somewhat difficult in any kind of output in Mandoc is the horizontal spacing. But apart from that, the bulk of the code is really straightforward and anybody could could easily write such a thing. Just a big dispatch table and tell it this macro goes to that kind of output. Now, Markdown is a really great example of how you must absolutely not design a language. <laughs> um, the first thing is it has a very easy goal. It doesn't want to do everything. That's good. You want to do simple things. It just wants to make it easy to write like a plain text email and to express anything that you could express in a plain text email. The problem is it fails that goal. For example, in a plain text email you can very easily write a definition list. Term means this and that. Term means this and that. But there is no syntax for that in Markdown. Then you have the problem of context sensitivity. Almost every token can take different meanings depending on where you put it. Uh, the famous thing that underscores mean Italy. Now what if you have a variable name that includes two underscores? And if you double the underscores, then it may, means both. Now what if you have if you have adjacent words that have bold and italic, then you have three adjacent underscores. Now, how do they pair up and so on and so on? There is no end of context sensitivity and ambiguity is resulting for it. Then, the language is fundamentally ill designed because it's a mix up of semantic and presentational markup. HTML nowadays and MDOC are clearly. Um, semantic, even though in their origin they were partly presentational, but at least in HTML5 that has been cleaned up. Not so in Markdown. Some of the components <coughs> are presentational, some are semantic, and many link the two in ways that are just wrong. Like, you can't switch off text filling without marking that it's program code. Right? Not good. Then about the worst thing is that a language should be dis designed as an independent language. So if you write just in the language, you can do what you want. That's not the case for Markdown. Um, it allows embedded HTML. Uh, okay, allowing embedding one language in another makes the thing complicated, but the point where it really gets bad is if the top level language is designed so badly that you don't really get away without doing that. And because of the lack of uh, expressiveness, you basically don't get away in Markdown without embedding the HTML. That would still not be fatal, but then you realize that there are crippling restrictions. There are some HTML constructs that you can't include in other Markdown constructs and vice versa. And what you end up doing is, because you need 
lack of expressiveness, you need a specific HTML construct, then you realize, oh, I can't include that in this kind of markdown construct, so I have to reformat the, the outer markdown construct as HTML2, and in the end, you end up with a file that is half HTML for that reason. So what's the point of the markdown language in the first place, if you end up with half HTML? <laughs> Um, it gets even more annoying when someone writes HTML in your markdown file, which references and has to generate by only certain markdown implementations. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> the, the point of it is that the asshole who made you admit markdown shit for your code styling conventions will now shut up because you've admitted markdown. It doesn't matter if it's happening. Yeah. So, <laughs> and my, my perhaps my favorite, the syntax is really inspired by the white space language, because if you have one trailing blank on the line, that doesn't mean anything. But if you have two trailing blanks on the line, that means a line break. So, no, no. Not only is trading white space syntax significant, but the amount of trading white space is important. Right? So, do not use markdown ever for anything, but if people force you to use markdown, oh, but by the way, there are lots of varieties, so if you use it, it will only work with some formats anyway, and not with the others, so another reason to not use it. If people force you to provide markdown documentation, that's no problem. Just write the documentation in the nice end of language, and then use mandoc to convert it. And what mandoc outputs is, um, is guaranteed more or less modular bugs to work with all formats because it just uses the original specification. Uh, can, you, can you do the, like Wikipedia has? Uh, and, uh, a summary of, of, of um, headings, basically, that you can click a heading and jump to the appropriate section. Click it. Uh, like, uh, yes. Table of contents is the, is the word. Okay. No, uh, Mandoc doesn't do a table of contents. You have certain you have of that they can do it. Let's just, but, so here if you click a header, it jumps to the header itself. If you click a manual page, it jumps to that other manual page. And if I find in some manual page an internal reference, so if you some, at some place, it would say, for an explanation of the error codes, look at the error section and I would click on the errors word, then it would jump to the error. So it does internal links, it does external links, but it doesn't show like Wikipedia summaries of the other page. I don't I haven't thought about it, but that can be done. Because if I write documentation I tend to write first the table of contents, some some kind of outline, and then people if, if they are searching like in 100 pages for something, they just look at the table of contents, oh, aha, they click the section. Basically, most of the pages have the exact same structure, but there are probably 1% of my pages which have some specific subsections. You go if you manage to get it to work with DPD, for instance, that would be cool because I have lots of subsections and the table of contents would be useful. Okay. okay. Not a pre page, <laughs> page, but a table of contents of account page. Okay, yeah. Because if you look at your basic web page, you only have a species and the species. More interesting the references. Feature request mode. <laughs> okay. So, where did I stop? Ah, yeah. Right, now we have a new topic. Um, Even SSL was from OpenSSL after the Hartley vulnerability in 2014, but 
that was just what triggered it. It was not the real reason. The real reason was a, a basic neglect of security practices and not just that single vulnerability. And the second reason was that the cooperation with OpenSSL with Sun with Icky and sometimes patches sent to OpenSSL would linger for months or years without being merged. Once forking was decided, everything happened very quickly and the initial focus was on deleting those codes, preparing the code for audit and auditing it, improving robustness and security, and of course, developing the new libtls that Bob just gave a great tutorial on. And yeah. Now, just like the OpenSSL code was way below OpenBSD quality standards, so was the documentation. The documentation of OpenSSL is incomplete, it's generally sloppy, and it was written in an inferior markup language in uh, pod. Um, pod is the second best markup language for uh, for documentation we have after MDoc, but still much worse than MDoc because it's purely presentational. Just like the code needed reformatting, so did the manual pages. But for the code, you could check that the binary, the output of the compiler, didn't change, which wasn't possible for with manual pages. So after reformatting, uh, everything had to be checked by hand, which took a very long time, so it's now four years later, and I'm only now presenting results from that work. <laughs> um, the tool used for the conversion uh, was written by, well, basically, if anything was written, then it's typically Christmas, who did it? He's very good at starting things and gets them very quickly to, to production and then it's easy to maintain them afterwards. So basically by 2000, oh, and conveniently, and I think it was by chance, correct me if that isn't true, um, conveniently just in the two weeks before a heart bleed, Christoph wrote that too. Because I was doing um, the, I was writing something that you just don't necessarily, or neither necessarily. So I needed to look at the documentation. Uh, oh, so it's actually it related. Was it was related. Yeah, great. Right. Anyway, within a year from the start of the Plot to MDoc project, it was basically um, in a state that could be used in production. So the work on actually converting the pages was started in, on, in the general OpenBSD hackathon in 2014. And then in this hackathon, I, in 2016, I converted the last 130 pages. Um, you cannot really convert pod to MDoc fully automatically because pod is a presentational language and you have to guess when it's marked up as bold, if it's a function name or whatever it is. It is to pick the right MDOT macro, so you have to pre process it, ma it manually. In part because sometimes there is no markup in the original whatsoever of the word that needs markup. In some, time, in some cases, because the program cannot automatically guess which markup will be the right one here for bold. Occasionally, the markup was just poor and bad in the original. And occasionally there are things that are unusually difficult to mark up, like callback functions that are always, almost always require, requires manual work. So I had to read all that text, also use that for improving the content, of course. Once the pages were converted, I systematically went through all the open SSL manual pages and check whether there were was anything that could be merged, any bug fixes, any missing documentation that we didn't have yet in LibreSSL, and brought all that in. And also, it was very tedious, even though in OpenSSL they have different licenses, 
different licenses on different parts of the code and manuals, they didn't have any license headers. So I had to check each and every file from who is the actual copyright owner and what is the actual license and put all that in. I also added missing pages from OpenSSL to our tree, removed inapplicable stuff and so on. Basically the, the goal is to have the LibreSSL manual pages better than the OpenSSL manual pages in each and every respect. So if anything is documented in OpenSSL, it is now also documented in LibreSSL in, in at least the same quality. And in addition to that, we have much more information, many more pages, many more substance in many of the pages. Then, once you have reached that stage that you are absolutely better in each and every respect, you of course have to maintain the thing or it will slowly be brought. At irregular intervals, I evaluate all the changes in OpenSSL since the last thing, and then they merge the changes that make sense and apply to our code. Of course, when there are local changes like TLS, libtls development or merging of OpenSSL one of one interfaces or classification, the manual pages have to be adjusted. And uh, we've done a number of other um, quality improvements in addition to that. The main problem that remains is that the majority of the public OpenSSL interfaces is simply undocumented. And you can't just go ahead and write manual pages for them because the interfaces are so ill-designed that many of them should probably not be public. So advertising <laughs> them in manual pages would be a bad idea. And even for specialists like Bob or Joel, it's often not easy to figure out should this be documented. And even if you could figure it out, then there would be so many manual pages to write that you would get overwhelmed. Still, in a few corners where it's particularly important, I have written some new pages. Uh, I'll skip the, the examples here um, and get to the summary about Libres uh, manual pages themselves, such that I can get on to the library design part. What remains to be done is uh, figure out which additional function should be documented and do that. Almost all pages require basic copy, copy editing because of the generally sloppy wording and incompleteness. The OpenSSL1 test tool um, didn't have um, even the first look yet, so that's basically still unchanged. I think as much as Bob doesn't really like working on the tool, I don't really like working on the manual. And the routine syncs with OpenSSL will become a real problem once they change to, uh, to become non-free software, once they change to Apache 2 license. I don't really know what to do about that yet. Okay. Um, lessons learned about API design. When you document a library, you really understand in which ways it is difficult to use and difficult to understand. And one of the main reasons, so here, I'm, I actually have six slides just with lessons learned, what you can do wrong in library design, just from looking at the open SSL documentation. And that is not everything that went wrong there, but just the things that went wrong about everywhere, that occur again and again everywhere, and I can't even go through all of that. What is particularly important is you really should use standard POSIX functions. Don't wrap them. If the target system don't have them, you can play, uh, provide replacement implementations, but don't use wrappers. And if you need to write functions that have C library similar semantics and make sure the semantic really matches. Don't name a function string comp if it doesn't return minus one or plus one according to the lexical ordering. 
um, very important, minimize the number of public entity functions, minimize the size of your library, because if you make it too big, it's always easy to add a few functions, but if you make it too big, then users cannot read all that stuff, and developers cannot write it, and you will end up in exactly the situation of open, BS, uh, open SSL, that half of it isn't documented. Um, you definitely know that you have get gone way overboard when you feel tempted to auto-generate function names with macros. Yes, OpenSSL actually does that. And if you try, you will find that it is almost impossible to document that kind of stuff. We should um, be just generating MDOC with the same macro as generating functions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> You can never ever auto generate documentation. Documentation is about making things, making technical things understandable for humans. And that cannot be automated. You really have to think about what does a human need to know about it, and you have to write it by hand. Doxygen can never work. Help to man can never work. You have to write documentation carefully, word by word, sentence by sentence by hand, or it will be terrible quality. Also, that's a reason to not embed documentation in code, like Perl does it. Because it's really a different thing, writing code and writing documentation. And it's better if it's maintained in different files. It can be maintained by the same person, because then the person <coughs> writing the documentation know what they are doing. But you have to be aware that writing code and documentation require a different mindset. I'd like to differ the Perl documentation is usually nice enough, but it's because it's written by people with brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So usually you write a big chunk of code that documents what's supposed to be happening, then you write the code, and they are just in the same file so that they don't get out of sync. That's the whole idea. Yeah, but it often... Okay, let's not do the discussion. We had some nice discussions, but it uh, forces me to, to skip some of the stuff. So I will just extremely briefly mention three big other things we did. We threw out um, SQLite from the OpenPSD base system, basically because uh, it moves too fast. They are adding 15,000 new lines of code a year. We can't audit all that. They are having about 10 releases a year. So I wrote a dedicated um, database backend for Mandoc. And the result happens to be that with 200,000 lines less of code, 15,000 lines less of code to audit per year, we have half the database sizes, double the lookup time, so at almost no maintenance effort. So throwing out the uh, SQLite was a really nice thing. You can, in the slides I think, you can look up details. Um, a lot of work has done recently for better to have much better support third party manual pages that are not ESD manual pages, in particular those written in the old man language, which are using a lot of low level raw constructs. Um, during the last year, I brought down the number of OpenBSD ports that still need raw for formatting their manual pages from 200 to 25 by doing a lot of reorganization in Mandoc and implementing many new features. And recently, in, in August this year, so less than a month ago, by implementing about 15 new features in Mandoc, I uh, reached the state where Mandoc can now handle even the GNU trough manual pages. So at some point, <coughs> we will be able to format everything, but there are still a few things to do. Um, Okay, I'll skip those. So, this slide shows which projects were announced at 
is the conferences over the years at which conferences <coughs> were completed. And when the solution was first presented, the red ones are the ones I mentioned here. Well, the talks at Euro BSD Con are a bit shorter than at BSD Con, so let's skip a bit. But uh, you see that not much remains open. You may think that we are done now, but actually we are not. The list of things that, that still be oh, here you see that some things in special in HTML were done between BSD CAN and HAL, so right in the last half year. Mostly improvements of HTML, CSS, style attributes, and uh, HTML, uh, yeah, HTML syntax violations. What still remains open are several details in various parsers. There are still problems in TPL, macros are not supported in TPL, and such things, and handling of third-party formats like ProPod, TechInfo, and some things in MAN. For example, it would really be great to have the Pro manual pages not translated to MAN, but to MDoc and have to have a semantic markup for them. So there are still quite a few things to do. All the same, MANDOC is used completely in each and every respect in OpenBSD, Alpine Linux, and Void Linux. The only thing that is missing now in FreeBSD is that they have still had a weaker MAN1 implementation, so a weaker manual page viewer that's just a shell script in FreeBSD, and the FreeBSD web manual pages still need migration to, man, to the man of man CGI. Everybody agrees that needs to be done. Just the work, okay, you have to find somebody who does the work. Um, in NetBSD, also the, the search tool is weaker. It's not yet the man of one. It's included by default, but totally outdated and by a village. Debian, Ubuntu, Gentoo, PKE, uh, source have official packages, and lots of systems have uh, unofficial packages. OpenBSD, Debian, and Arch Linux are now using it for the online manual pages. Okay, so the final conclusion is Mandoc has been the standard BSD toolkit for manual pages on the command line since about EuroBSDCon 2015. Now it's also becoming the standard formatter for the web due to its extensive support for semantic markup and internal and external hyperlinking. It now covers well above 99% of ports due to the improved ROF support. And again, never try to write markdown documentation by hand. <laughs> write angle instead and generate the markdown with Mando. So, the, the list of contributors is really very long. It's four pages. And that's only the, the list of contributors since I last spoke here. So, I can't possibly mention them all, but I would like to mention Anthony Bentley, who has contributed about 10 patches, dozens of bug reports, and who also did about a third of the LibreSSL conversion that I talked about. Christian Weisgerber, not yet from BSD.org, has done lots and lots of work on the use graph removal, in particular analyzing all the ports, what they needed. Michael Stapelberg of the Debian project has designed and written most of the Mandoc B and Catman utilities. Mark Espy, I think I've seen, yeah, um, did a very nice thing implementing smaller postscript output. Uh, you shouldn't be misled. Uh, if you really need good postscript output for manual pages, you should use graph. You should use graph because that's a real typesetting system. But if you just need a quick PDF file or a quick postscript file, then manual is good for it, but it's not a real typesetting system. But he's that was sir contributed many things and also integrated Mandoc into FreeBSD. I, I don't really know what I would be doing without Jason McIntyre, the OpenBSD manual page maintainer. I do, fix previous. <laughs> what? Fix previous. 
After every movement, one of us does to amend. Oh, it takes faces. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, let's say it takes previous. <laughs> of course, it fixes everything. That's uh, that's what uh, results in a good quality of OpenBSD manual pages. But also, I had countless discussions with him, and he had so many useful suggestions, and it's always testing stuff. Then uh, Thomas Klausner has been uh, uh, with a NetBSD org has been very helpful. In particular, um, we have completely integrated the whole functionality, every detail of the former NetBSD Ember Blint tool into Mandoc. So now, um, if you run Mandoc Tlint, you don't need Ember Blint anymore. It's no longer maintained because it's now integrated. And Joel Singh, of course, provided all the feedback I needed regarding LibreSSL. And then, yeah, the first one that I, the first one on the second page, is, well, I won't mention him because he's the one who started all this in the first place. <laughs> right. Questions? Yes? Did any of the new uh, documentation, the new manuals for LibreSSL end up in uh, got merged into OpenSSL? Oh, that's an interesting story. <laughs> um, I got into a friendly conversation with, oh, how is it called, Rich Salts, I think Rich Salts, because of some small patch. Around the time I did the, I completed the conversion. And uh, I feeded some patches to him that he integrated, but they were really small. And I told him about this thing, and he said, yeah, that sounds interesting. And I said, okay, I'll invest an hour or so to provide um, a big diff of the M dot code. So from the thing that I got right after the automatic conversion to the point after I had fixed lots and lots of bugs in the content and sent that to him. Now of course, and he says thank you, of course it's a patch to M dot code and they have the pod code. So I admit that what they would have to do is look at the patches and manually apply the corrections to the files that look completely different for them. But those are the, all these patches that I sent to him are actually errors into content. So you might think that, okay, even though it's a bit tedious, fixing bugs in the content might be worth it. But so you have to look at the output and go back and patch the Perl that generated the output. It's no different than changing their assembly. They didn't do it yet. <laughs> and I recently talked to him again, still friendly, so in that sense the cooperation works. And he said, okay, no, we, we probably can't do it because it's too much work. So basically it's like in your code, people report a bug, they say what the bug actually is, describe it in words, and you say, okay, because you can't send a patch that fixes it, I, I, I don't have the time to look at the bug. So that's more or less the status, and of course, unless they pay me for it, I'm not really willing to, to backport the patches to their tree, because that would take me weeks of work. And I doubt that, I didn't try asking them whether they would pay me for it, but I, <laughs> I, I kind of doubt that they would. If they don't care enough to do it themselves, why would they pay somebody else? Right. I, I would actually like to feed that stuff back, because if people write better code for OpenSSL, and if people avoid errors in writing code for OpenSSL that basically are are a result of wrong documentation, then that's beneficial for everybody, for the ecosystem at large, for LibreSSL users, because people expect the right thing when they come from elsewhere. But I don't know what to do if, if you report back to people and they basically say, oh, it's too much work to look into that. It depends what we are going to excuse is, either we don't have enough people or we don't have enough money, we can choose what to excuse is Open cell does not have the not enough money problem. So they don't tell you people. <laughs> okay.
Uh, not actually a question, but a remark. Uh, when you said 14 years ago, uh, people did care about uh, human readable HTML, actually they didn't. No, didn't uh, that's not what I said. I said 30 years ago, it was important to write human readable HTML, and today it's just as relevant to do 30 it. 30 years ago, there was no HTML whatsoever anyway. Um, the MDOT language was developed in 1989-1990 and HTML was developed at about the same time, so it should also be 1988, so that's exactly 30 years ago. 1989. So that would mean that um, Cynthia Livingston developed the MDOT language in the same year as HTML. That's it. Kind of, it kind of shows because the the principles are, are very similar and also um, one final anecdote when I go to Linux lists like the Roth, I'm also a Roth developer so I have committed access to the GNU Roth official GNU repository and I committed about 50 patches during the last 10 years there um, when I talk people, to people in that community they typically say no I can't use Amazon and I say, why? Well, it's too complicated. Mm -hmm. it, has about, it has about 30 macros, and I have to learn all those 30 macros. And that re really reminds me of people who say, I need a content management, web uh, content management system on our website because I can't write HTML. Why can't you write HTML? Well, I have to learn all those elements. Well, that, that, there are about 20 elements you need. If, if you don't get into the really difficult stuff like CSS. Well, no, I can't. Languages like HTML and MDoc are really the absolutely and objectively simplest languages that are around, not even programming languages. So, if programmers say, I can't learn that, I really don't don't know what to think because it takes you about half an hour to read it once and then you have a cheat sheet on the side and pick what you need. This is why Markdown exists. Because it makes you all that too hard. <laughs> yeah, but Markdown is actually, I've shown that Markdown is actually so much more complicated and hard to use. Only if you're logging more than half a page. The, the, the problem is it, it kind of works, <coughs> and so, so you intuitively start and it kind of works, and then uh, it, everything breaks when you like change the, the parser or anything about it, uh, about the uh, uh, workflow, and well, but then you're stuck, right? Because you have written so much already, so you will not stop. So basically you are saying it works as long as you are not using it seriously. No, no. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. As, as, as long as you, you didn't have, uh, if, as long as you have had a uh, hard look at it. Mark the ticket. You want CMS, I assume that you want the uh, image uh, Ajax sheet like that, you don't want to write that sheet like that. And you don't want to learn sheet query and sheet like that. So, thanks for your attention and for the discussion.